bless our class today. Thank you for Dr. Minnick and for um, the time that he's given to uh, preparing for this class and setting aside time to spend with us as well. We pray that it will be a profitable uh, session today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I don't think we need much introduction with Dr. Menick. Um, so he has spoken for us before, and <laughs> when he did, I found it very, uh, very, very just thinking through all the content and processing all the content it was hard to keep up with, which is great. I like to have to think hard. So anyway, I hope your brain's warmed up. I hope you're ready to go. And um, I'm sure that we'll be challenged by the time. So uh, yeah, Dr. Minnick, the time is yours. Looking forward to it. And sorry about the delay this morning. <laughs> my, my apologies. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Can you hear me all right there? It's great. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, when I clicked on the link, it said uh, there was another meeting already in session. And so I had to find a bit of a work around there, but, and actually I was going to share a PowerPoint here. Um, can you help me out with how I would um, do that? I think you're set now. Sorry. You're good. Okay. Let's see. So if I, if I display my PowerPoint and then I think if I click here and do share, can you all see the PowerPoint now? Looks great. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Great. All right. Yeah, well, we're going to be talking today about um, Romans chapter one, verses three through four, a little bit of a controversial statement there about uh, Christ being, as a lot of the translations put it, declared to be the son of God by, uh, by the resurrection from the dead. And we will move fairly quickly, as Dr. Arnold said. Um, but if you're intrigued, by all means, just let me know, and I'd be happy to send you my dissertation and um, for what it's worth, there's there's a lot more there that backs up or uh, fleshes out the kinds of things that we'll be talking about today. Um, but basically, the dissertation was an investigation of the intersection of sonship and resurrection. And Dr. Arnold, I, I know I presented the dissertation a, a few months back. Is are, are these the same group of people as were there on that occasion as well, or some? Nice. some Okay. Not exactly. Some overlap. Okay. And I don't mind. I mean, that content was so core. I'm happy to, I'm not worried about overlap. I'm happy to hear it again, just to get yeah. it into my mind deeper. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll kind of, yeah, we'll kind of work through some of that a little bit. Um, but basically, I just started to notice that resurrection and sonship were linked in a number of passages together. Um, so like, you know, the obvious one is in Romans 8, 23, where we're told that our Quiathesia, or our what's typically called adoption, is the redemption of our bodies, and the two are equated there. Um, that when our bodies are redeemed, that is our coming into um, some future sense of sonship. Um, in Luke twenty thirty six, we're told that uh, one day we will not be like the, uh, or we will be like the angels, and we'll be sons of God because we are sons of the resurrection. And so there's a connection there. Somehow resurrection imparts sonship um, in what Christ was saying. Um, but also for Christ, in some sense, uh, Christ became the son of God at his uh, resurrection. In Acts 13, Paul is quoting Psalm 27, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And he says that was fulfilled at the resurrection. In some way, the resurrection was a, was a beginning. Um, in Colossians 1.18, and Revelation 1, 5, so both in Paul and in John, Christ is called the firstborn from the dead, and it's in the plural, the firstborn from the dead ones. Um, and so in some sense, Christ is, is the firstborn um, among those who will come from the dead. Um, and then here in, in Romans 8, our, uh, our adoption or our coming into sonship in the future is in some way connected to uh to our uh resurrection in romans 8 23 and then we're told a little bit later on that it's by conformity to christ's body that that will come about um in verses 28 through 29 uh, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and so there obviously the word firstborn has a family idea because it's talking about among many brethren and uh and our glorification um is in some way uh, coming into sonship by conformity to Christ so that he'll be the firstborn among many brethren 
In other words, the birth that he had, we would also um, experience. Uh, and so in all of these passages, sonship is somehow imparted by resurrection, not only to us, but also uh, to Christ. And that obviously was just a little bit uh, intriguing to me because, you know, we know that Christ has been the son of God from all eternity. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 4 that God sent the son. He was already the son before he was sent in the incarnation. Um, and so the passage that we're going to look at today is obviously very significant because we're told there that something happened to Christ by resurrection, um, and it has something to do with his sonship. Uh, he was declared to be the son of God uh, by resurrection, um, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into that passage and have a look at it. So let's, let's have a look. Um, I'm going to just put the passage up here on the screen. Let's see if the PowerPoint will advance. There we go. Um, and uh, let's see here. Okay. All right. Okay. So you can see at the beginning of the book, Paul says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And uh, hold on a second. I'm going to move, minimize this, move it out of the way. There we go. So he's set apart for the gospel of God. So this is the topic that he's going to cover in this book is the gospel. And that gospel was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And it's and then you can see I've laid out kind of structurally the passage that we're going to look at today. The gospel is concerning his son who came from the seed of David, according to the flesh, who was appointed son of God in power, according to the Holy Spirit, from the resurrection of the dead. And you can see very clearly there's a lot of parallel between verses three and four, and we'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit. Um, but in some way, he was appointed, or a lot of the translations say declared son of God in power um, by the Holy Spirit, by resurrection uh, from the dead. And so um, what I found basically is that if you take this passage in isolation, um, it's very hard to make out what exactly is going on here. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people, they, they look at this passage and try to understand it all on its own and, and end up um, with this interpretation or that interpretation. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of times they, they basically just look at the word appointed or, or uh, declared and what does that mean? And then they build an interpretation off of that. Um, but if you try to understand this passage within the context of what's going on in Romans um, and more broadly, within the context of Paul's theology of sonship and resurrection, then it makes a lot more sense. And you can you can figure out um, and, and make sense of what's going on here. And more broadly, even just than Paul's understanding of sonship and resurrection, then there's the whole Old Testament um, context of the messianic expectation that Paul's building off of. Um, and so what we're going to do here is, is take a little time um, at the beginning to sort of orient ourselves before we actually dive into the passage. Um, so we're going to start here. Let's see, make the PowerPoint. We're going to start with talking about interpretive options. Like what do people actually say about this passage um, and kind of understanding a little bit of the debate there. And then we'll talk about the context of the passage, Paul's theology, the Old Testament, um, the interaction of sonship and resurrection. And then finally, once we have all that behind us, then we'll actually land in exegesis. And um, I think typically you all would uh, spend about an hour together and take a little break and then spend a second hour together after a break. And so maybe I think we'll hit the first two points in the first hour. And then in the second hour, we'll actually get to the, the exegesis and looking at the passage um, itself. Uh, but we'll, we'll kind of do it in that order. Um, so let's start with the interpretive options. Let's, let's talk about what people say when they come to this passage um and uh, and why they said so somebody tell me just you know we read through the passage and you've heard me talk for a second but can someone unmute their mic and and tell us just really simply what is the basic interpretive question here that we are trying to understand any thoughts So the passage says that we were, or that Christ was declared to be the son of God. 
by resurrection from the dead, by the Holy Spirit. So what's the question? Anyone want to venture a guess? A couple of things jumping, jumping in the chat. Okay. Let me see. I'm not sure that I can see the chat here because I have the PowerPoint up. Um, here, I'll just read it. Uh, someone said, is it the question of by? Someone else said, what changed? The word changed when Jesus rode, rose from the dead. Yes. Uh, someone wrote, what is the nature of Christ's sonship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if good. I was going to take a shot at it personally, um, so I, I'm going to connect it to the question of appointed. He was appointed son of God, and I want to know what that, yeah. how we fit that word in, because that's that seems like an interpretive crux. Yeah. yeah, so if I, I'll just put it up here really simply. One option is the resurrection made Christ the son of God, and the other option is the resurrection did not make Christ the son of God. He already was son of God before the resurrection. Um, and and just really simply, that's that's the question that that most people are asking when they come to this passage. Um, I'm going to be arguing for the first position that the resurrection made Christ Son of God, in some sense, and we're going to nuance that um, so that we stay out of heresy, obviously, because that's that's always the goal. Um, but um, before we do that, I think it would be helpful to consider the other side. Right, people who would argue that the resurrection did not make Christ Son of God in any sense, um, and uh, so I'll just I'll underline that so we can keep in mind that we're thinking about that position. And there's three basic arguments that people would make um, in favor of that from this passage, um, and it all kind of re revolves around. I'm really glad for what everyone said there in the chat. It, someone nailed it there that it it really all revolves around this question or, or this phrase. Um, that he was declared son of God with power. What does the word declared mean? Um, and what, what actually changed at the resurrection? What actually happened there? Um, so on the one hand, some people would see here an impartation of sonship to Christ. In other words, by resurrection, he was declared to be the son of God. That's the position that I'm taking. And others see merely an impartation of power to Christ. Um, he was the son of God from before the resurrection. And the resurrection confirmed or proclaimed or vindicated um, that pre-resurrection claim to be the Son of God. So the Son of God was declared to be uh, such. Um, so the first argument that people would make in, in favor of that position or trying to defend that position is they would argue that the word herizo, the word that's translated declared, um, merely means declared. That, uh, that nothing new happened here. Nothing uh, was uh, was different after the resurrection than before. It was merely a declaration of what was already true. Um, and that's very tempting because when you look at the translations, the, the King James, the New King James, the New American Standard, the ESV, they all would translate it as um, declared. But when you start looking at literature, that's pretty much an antiquated argument. You won't find a lot of people today who are arguing this word means declared. Um, like I might, you know, declare that my name is Andrew. Well, it didn't make my name Andrew by declaring that. It was already my name. I just told you what was true. Um, and you would find very few people who are arguing nowadays that the word actually means that. You do find it in older literature, like Hodge's commentary on Romans or, or things like that. But most contemporary authors um, are instead looking at the way that this word is used. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on. But they're looking at the way that the word is used, and they're saying the word actually means appointed, not just declared. Like something actually changed. Something was appointed to Christ here. Or he was appointed to something. Um, and we'll, we'll get into kind of some of that, that terminology and that usage later on. But it's interesting that even these people who will say that the word means appointed rather than declared, um, when they start trying to flesh out exactly what that means and the Christology here, a lot of times they de facto kind of revert back to uh, making the word just mean declared. Um, because if you use the word appointed, uh, then, then you know, that, that has certain implications for sonship and things like that. And they don't want to go there. 
And so they'll, they'll admit, yeah, it, it means appointed, but, but then when they try to actually flesh out what it's saying, um, they, they revert back essentially to a meaning of declared. For example, here's, here's a, a person here. Um, this is uh, Brendan Byrne who wrote on the idea of, of, um, uh, of sonship and things like this. And uh, he says there, what is clear is that the formula, Romans 1, 3 through 4, proposes a two-stage Christology. So verse 3 would be one stage, verse 4 would be another stage. And he says, while Messiahship, son of David, is conceded to the earthly career of Jesus, in verse 3, sonship of God is reserved for his risen state. All right, so he's, he's kind of giving... Um, you know, he, he's basically saying something was changed here at the resurrection, and it has to do with sonship. But then he goes on to nuance his position, um, and he says that Christ's sonship was hidden during his earthly life, and it was publicly and gloriously revealed, which essentially means declared only at the resurrection. And so as soon as he starts trying to talk about exactly what did happen at the resurrection, he kind of reverts back to this, this idea of declared. Um, a second argument that they'll pull out is that the phrase with power modifies son adjectivally rather than peridzo declared or appointed adverbially. In other words, what changed at the resurrection um, is that the son was appointed to a position of power, not that the resurrection was a powerful appointment to sonship. Um, and so that little phrase in power modifies son in other words, before the resurrection, he was son of God without power. After the resurrection, he was son of God with power. And it's that, that uh, impartation of power that changed um, at the resurrection. Uh, and that, that was what happened. Uh, for example, Murray Harris, um, he says in these two verses, the apostle is defining the two successive stages of Christ's career. Right? His earthly experience had its beginning in his descent from David whereas his open installment as son of God came about at the time of and because of his resurrection from the dead. It was not the sonship of Christ, but his sonship with power that was inaugurated by the resurrection. For elsewhere, Paul teaches that Jesus was God's son before the resurrection occurred. And so in Harris's view, the resurrection merely vindicated or confirmed um, the sonship of, of Jesus. And so basically what they're saying is what changed is that Jesus was given power, not that he was made the son. Um, and that's a, a very widely argued uh, position today. All right, the third thing that they would say um, is that Christ needed this declaration of sonship by appointment of power because his sonship had been hidden in the weakness of the incarnation. In other words, when Christ came, he appeared to just be a man, to be weak. Um, and, uh, and, and because of that, uh, he needed the resurrection to show everybody that he really was the son of God, to make that, that uh, uh, essentially declaration um, and to be given power again. And the weakness of the incarnation was removed and suddenly everyone realized, oh yes, he actually was the son of God. Um, and they point to the little phrase there in verse three, according to the flesh, and they see in that a reference to the weakness of the incarnation. And so verse three is talking about um, weakness in his humanity. And then verse, verse four talks about the resurrection unveiling what was really there all along, um, that, he was, that he was actually the powerful son of God. Um, for example, I've got a, uh, an example of this, of this argument. Francis Durwell would say, before Christ had been born son of David in the weakness of the flesh, but in the resurrection, he was established son of God in the glory of power. The humiliations of his time on earth covered his dignity as son, but did not efface it. They did, however, make it suffer a real eclipse, for the weakness of his flesh was servile livery, a disguise put on over the sonship, which made him appear as simply a son of, of David. Um, and what we'll find is, as we kind of look at the passage itself, we'll find that these arguments, these three arguments here, um, are kind of, they're, they're very strained. Um, they didn't really account very well for what's actually going on um, in the passage. So the question is, if these don't really account well for what's going on in the passage, why would someone argue this way? You know, what would drive them to the position that I've underlined 
there on the screen that Christ was not in any way made son of God at the resurrection. Um, and I, I think the answer is obvious that they're trying to avoid the ancient, um, the ancient belief of adoptionism, which held that Christ was merely a man and that he was adopted into divine sonship and deity. Um, and either that happened at his baptism or his resurrection, but in some way, this person was merely a man was adopted to become the son of God um, at, at his at his baptism or at his resurrection. Um, and some people would even say that this is a pre Pauline adoptionist hymn or text that Paul's adapted to become, you know, more Christian or that kind of thing. Um, well, ultimately, Paul elsewhere, uh, like in Galatians 4, tells us that Christ was the son of God before he was sent. Um, and so we know that, that Paul isn't holding to some kind of adoptionist um, position here. Um, and I also would argue that I'm not holding to an adoptionist position, even though I'm arguing for the first position, the one on the left, on the screen. Um, because what I'm saying is that there's some sense in which Christ did become the Son of God by resurrection that isn't incongruous with Paul's theology of, res or of sonship from all eternity past. Um, uh, from, from his pre-incarnate state. And when we look at this passage and at other of Paul's writings, we find that, um, that this sense of sonship that was imparted at resurrection was an Adamic sonship, and it pertained to his humanity. So at the, at the resurrection, Christ reclaimed the sonship that Adam was created with, and that pertained to, uh, to his human nature. And so there is no contradiction here uh, with, uh, with his being the son of God from all eternity as pertaining to his divine nature. Um, when Christ came in the incarnation, he took on a full human nature. He was humanity um, in, in its, uh, or he was 100% human. And, um, and as part of that humanity, he reclaimed something that Adam lost, and that pertains to his human nature. Um, uh, his, his divine nature, on the other hand, uh, pertaining to a second or, or to, a, to an original sense of his sonship, um, it is in no way set aside or abrogated by his coming to take this, this second sense of sonship that pertains to his human nature. And that in a nutshell is, is what I'm arguing, and we'll, we'll kind of flesh that out and, and talk um, more about that. So another, basically what I'm saying is this, this question, did Christ become the Son of God at the resurrection, or was he already the Son of God, is actually a false dichotomy. Um, there is actually in the scriptures, I think, uh, teaching that, that pertaining to his human nature, he reclaimed Adamic sonship. Pertaining to his divine nature, he already possessed sonship. Um, and so you can hold to both and not be a heretic. Um, at least my dissertation committee thoughts there. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the options. This is the two different ways that people would approach this passage. Um, uh, and, and we've looked a little bit at, at what they would say from the passage to try to argue that Christ in no way became the son of God at the resurrection. Um, and that, that kind of orients us a little bit to the questions here uh, that people are asking and uh, the answers that they're giving. And so now we'll move on and spend a little bit of time just talking about the context of this passage. Um, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time here and then we'll take a break and we'll actually dive um, into, into the passage itself. Um, but, you know, when you think about Paul's epistles, a lot of times at the beginning of his epistles, he makes these um, really theologically rich statements that appear to be uh, very isolated. You know, he doesn't take the time to stop and explain the whole theology that the statement is coming out of. He just kind of gives this summary, um, really deep theological statement. Um, and then later on in the book, he may explain it, or he may just assume that the reader knows the theology that the statement is coming out of. And, um, and, and basically when you look at what's going on here in this passage, I, I, think, I think that's what's happening here. Um, the statement isn't isolated in that it doesn't fit with Paul's theology, 
it's isolated just in that Paul doesn't take the time to stop and explain it. He's going to spend the rest of the book explaining it. Um, but he kind of throws it out there um, at the beginning. So to understand what's going on here, uh, we can't just take the passage in isolation. You can see I put the reference up there on the screen. It's just kind of sitting there on its own, kind of down in the corner, isolated, kind of lonely. You know, and you can't, if, if you approach the passage that way, you're kind of scratching your head and trying to figure out what on earth is going on here. Um, but that passage happens within a context of the book of Romans, right? Um, in fact, it's an introduction to the whole book of Romans. Paul's going to spend the book of Romans talking about the gospel. And he gives us here in this, in, in this statement at the beginning, just kind of a little seed form of, of what he's going to talk about throughout the rest of the book. Um, so there's a whole context of the book of Romans. But, but beyond that, there's Paul's theology. Paul had thoughts about what sonship and resurrection were and how they interacted with each other. Um, and when you look throughout his writings, it comes up actually quite often um, that he had very definite, um, very definite thoughts about, about the theological intersection of these two. And he never actually sits down and takes a chapter of scripture to explain it all. Romans 8 is kind of the closest that we come to that. Right? But, but when you look throughout his writings, you can see that, that he had a whole theology that was going on um, and that he was drawing that theology from the Old Testament messianic expectation. And what, what the Old Testament was looking forward to in Christ, Paul comes along and says, hey, guess what? Christ fulfilled all that. Um, and, and a lot of that revolves around his sonship and his resurrection um, and, uh, and, and Adam and these things. Um, and so when you look at this passage that we're looking at in front of us, you've got themes of the royal Davidic lineage. You've got sonship. You've got life by resurrection. You've got the life-giving ministry of the spirit. You know, these are huge theological concepts, and Paul's going to develop these later on in the book, primarily in chapter 8 of Romans, um, but here he just kind of gives them in this little two-verse summary, um, kind of a little teaser for what's coming later, um, and, uh, and, and it's when you look at that context that I think you can figure out um, what's, what's going on here in this passage. And, and they all flow this way. They, they start with the Old Testament messianic expectation. And when you understand what's going on there in the Old Testament, then you can sort of see why Paul says the things that he says. He's, he's assuming things from the Old Testament on the on knowledge on the part of his readers. And then Romans is, I think, one of the most concentrated places where he discusses these things. Um, and in Romans 1, 3 through 4, he's just kind of summarizing what he, what he intends to expand um, throughout the book um, with regard to Christ. So let's start with Romans. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Romans. And you all are going through Romans in this class, um, which is just ideal because you've already got it all figured out anyway. Um, and I don't even need to say anything, right? Um, but, uh, but let me ask you this. What is the main topic that Paul puts out in Romans 1, 3 through 4? What does he put out for our consideration? We all focus on the sonship of Christ, but really, like, what's the main overarching topic here? Well, it's, it's found in verse 1. It's the gospel, right? So Paul isn't coming to us and saying, hey, I want to tell you something about the sonship of Christ. He says, hey, I want to talk to you about the gospel, all right? Now, the gospel pertains to the Son of God, and then he tells us something about the sonship of Christ, but the main thing that, that he's putting out here is the gospel, um, and, uh, and he's going to He's going to lay out that gospel, that good news, over how many chapters of Romans? Well, primarily, he's going to lay it out over the first eight chapters. And then in chapters 9 through 11, he moves on to address a very specific question, uh, kind of an objection, that, uh, that Israel had a lot of the same promises as what we're given. And if God didn't keep them for Israel, why is he going to keep them for us? And so he kind of moves on to a little bit of a different topic in 9 through 11. And then in 12 and following, chapters 12 and following, he moves on to um, kind of a very practical section of the book. But, but the gospel is primarily laid out in, in the first eight chapters of, of the book. And, uh, and what we find here, I think, in this passage is the seed form of, of what, he's going to, what he's going to lay out. Um, and when you, when you look at that treatise on the gospel in the first eight chapters of Romans, the culmination of it is found in Romans chapter 8. 
that's the capstone. It's like, it's what it's all working towards um, in Romans 8. It's, it's the big event of the future um, that Paul is, is laying out there. Um, and here in this book, he or here in this passage, he's kind of giving the seed, uh, the seed formula. Um, so let's let's focus on Romans eight for a second. Let's let's talk about Romans eight, and hopefully, um, a lot of you were able to read um, the little the the snippet from the dissertation about it's about twenty pages that was the homework for the class, and that kind of lays out a little bit of um, of I think what's what's going on there in that chapter. Um, with regard to this question specifically. Um, but I, I thought what we could do um, in order to talk about the context here, this discussion of the context, is we could orient our discussion around kind of five questions um, that would guide our thinking. So the first question would be, um, what is the big problem that Romans 8 presents a solution to? And I don't know if, if it's possible for anybody to unmute, or, or maybe you could just think about it in your in your head for a second. What's the big problem that Romans 8 presents a solution to? Well, the big problem is, is death. Um, and the solution that Romans 8 presents is resurrection. Um, and so when Paul thinks about the gospel that he's going to lay out in eight chapters of Romans here, um, the capstone or the, the, uh, the culmination, the, the, uh, the end of that that he, that he uh, looks forward to is resurrection. That's, that's the, the pinnacle of our salvation. Um, and uh, and he, he uses the word glory repeatedly throughout that chapter to capture this idea of, of resurrection. And then he gets to the end and he says, you know, those whom he uh, for new, he called and predestinated, and he goes through all those steps of salvation. And the last one is he glorified them. And and Paul's looking ahead to that day when when glorification will happen by resurrection. This is this is the capstone of our um, of our salvation there. And so in Paul's mind, Christ died not only to to save our immaterial part, but also to save and to redeem our bodies. Um, this is an inherent part of what we are, um, and this is what Christ uh, died uh, for. And the culmination of our salvation is that entrance in verse 23, that entrance into sonship that is our resurrection. Paul says that um, that our, uh, he uses the word huyathasia, which a lot of translations will use adoption. Um, he says our adoption is our resurrection. This is the caption. This is the end that it's all working towards uh, one day, is that we would be made sons of God in some sense by, uh, by resurrection. So this is what Romans 8 is, is driving at, is that there's this future day coming of resurrection, and it is going to be in some sense um, an impartation of, uh, of sonship. So the next big question is, um, why does resurrection restore sonship? And this was the research question that I started with in, in my dissertation. What does resurrection have to do with sonship? Um, you know, if, you know, God, God's looking ahead at the future of, of, uh, of our eschatology, our personal eschatology. And, and there's all these events that happen. Um, there's our entrance into his presence. Um, there's our, there's, there's the, uh, the, the great white throne judgment, um, which uh, thankfully we won't be at. There's the Bema Seat of Christ, and, and then there's all eternity with, with Christ. And there's just a lot that's going to happen. Um, why didn't God just impart sonship in some sense at one of these other events? Like, what is it about resurrection that in and of itself is actually um, an impartation of sonship? And it's, it's at this point that I kind of have to put the lecture on pause and just kind of summarize my dissertation, if you all can bear with me. It's not a commercial break, but it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a pause in the lecture. And we're going to just kind of jump in and I'm going to summarize the thesis or the discovery of my dissertation. And then we'll jump back into our discussion of this passage. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm just going to summarize in five points. 
kind of the argument of my dissertation. And remember, the question that we're asking is, what does resurrection have to do with sonship? Why is resurrection an imparting of, of sonship? Well, the first, uh, the first thing is that, um, you know, when I, when I started looking throughout the scriptures at these passages that talk about sonship and resurrection, I realized very quickly there's actually a third theological concept that's in a lot of those passages. You have sonship, you have resurrection, and then you have the image of God appears in a lot of these passages um and it it looks or it seems like um that uh um that that the image of god is is the theological link between resurrection and sonship um think about this in romans 8 right in romans 8 a lot of what paul talks about he casts as being a reclaiming of Adam. So he talks there in, in Romans 8 um, about resurrection, and he presents that as being fundamentally an undoing of the curse in Genesis 3. You know, he talks about the creation groaning under our imperfect rule. Uh, he talks about um uh he talks about us groaning he talks about death which came in genesis 3 um <clears throat> and so he he's presenting resurrection and all of these things as being in some way an undoing of genesis 3 all right so if these things are an undoing of genesis 3 then to understand them we probably want to go back to genesis 1 through 2 and the original creation in other words, whatever God is doing, if it's an undoing of the curse, then probably it's a redoing of what Adam was created with. Um, and so to understand them, we can, you know, it, perhaps the clue is found in, in looking back at the creation story um, and at Adam. Um, and when you look back at the creation story, um, I think, you know, what, what you see there is that, that Adam was created in God's image. This was the big, uh, th this is the big um, uh, theological concept in that story of Adam's creation. God made man in his image. Um, and there's a lot of discussion of what the image means. You know, what is the image of God? But when you, when you flip over just four chapters later in Genesis 5, you find there that, that Moses intentionally parallels God's creation of Adam in his image with Adam's having a son, Seth, in his image. And, uh, and in the dissertation, I take a little while to argue that that's actually a very much intentional parallel, that, that Moses is trying to say to us that what happens when a father has a son is, is a lot like what happened when God created Adam. Um, and, and that we can understand the creation of Adam by our own experience of, of having children, right? And I, I have um, three, three sons. Seth is six, and Micaiah is four, and Levi is one. And then we have a daughter due to be born in about three or four weeks. So actually, just last night, we were thinking about a name uh, for our daughter. What are we going to name our daughter? You know, it's an exciting time. Um, but whenever you, when when you when a human being has a child, um, they give to that child their human nature. They don't give to them the nature of an elephant or of a a lion. They they give them a human nature. A parent imparts their nature and their life to their children. Um, and when God created Adam, God gave to Adam many of His attributes. We call them the communicable attributes, and that is the image of God. Right? Adam was made like God in a lot of ways that the animals are not. Um, and God gave to Adam um, this nature uh, of, of, uh, of his children. Well, a second thing that we have to think about is, is that this concept of the image of God, and I'll just represent it with a circle there, this, the image of God, the nature that God gives to his children um, was holistic. In other words, the body was a part of it, not just the immaterial part. Um, and so because the image of God is holistic, um, both the immaterial and the material part 
or both the immaterial and the material are part of it, um, the body is a part of that filial or that, that sonship nature. To be a son of God, you have God's nature, and the body is a part of that. Um, and I spent a while in the dissertation arguing for that, um, for that fact. Um, and then further, we see there in Genesis that it was the image of God that qualified man to be able to reign um, and to fulfill the dominion mandate that God gave, um, that God gave to Adam. All right. The linchpin of the image of God, um, the heart of it, the apex of it, is possessing these two parts, the immaterial and the material, together in life. Um, death is separating the immaterial and the material. Um, and the body is taken away and put in the ground. Um, and that's, that's our ultimate failure to rule over this earth in Genesis 3. Instead of us ruling, now we become dust and the creation reclaims us. Um, and we ultimately fail in our dominion. Um, and, uh, and so life, um, possessing life, is, is the, the apex of what it means to be a son of God um, in this way. Uh, but as you know, in, in Genesis 3, Adam lost that. Um, he sinned. And so dominion was lost. And now instead of us ruling the creation, the creation rules us. And, and we struggle to maintain our existence. And finally, we die. And we go into the grave. And uh, creation reclaims our body and triumphs over it. Um, the material part of the image of God is taken. Um, and, uh, and Adam lost all that. But God is, is restoring that. And that's the message of scripture, that God is restoring this filial nature. God is making us sons of God once again. And that's a two-stage process, um, the two stages of life in the spirit. Um, regeneration and sanctification and then glorification when we enter God's presence um, restores our immaterial part. Um, and we're becoming more and more into the image of Christ pertaining to our inner immaterial man. Um, but uh, resurrection restores the material part of the nature of God's sons. And so it's in that sense that resurrection is an imparting of sonship. Um, this nature that God gives to his children um, in our current state is yet incomplete. Um, our immaterial part has to be finally perfected when we enter God's presence. And beyond that, our material part has to be restored. Um, if we're going to once again have the nature of God's children, um, and that will, will happen at resurrection. And well, what is Christ's role? Well, because he was fully human, Christ's human nature included the material part of the image of God. He was fully human. He had a human body. Um, and, and Paul tells us that, um, uh, that uh, uh, it was restored by resurrection to be what our bodies will one day be made by union with him. We'll, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 15 in a second and um, some passages like that. And so Christ's role really is, is the prototype for this restoration process. Um, and in that sense, he is the first to be born from the dead. Um, in, and he went through that, that birth process that, that by conformity to his body, we might one day by resurrection go through it as well. Um, and that's his role. Okay, so that's my, my whole dissertation, like one little bit. And if you want to read the, the whole thing, which I wouldn't encourage, um, you, you're very welcome to though, and you can email me and I'd be very happy to send it to you. Um, dissertations are something that you write so that they can sit on a shelf somewhere, right? Um, but, but if you're at all curious, I'd, I'd love to send it to you. And hopefully that kind of orients you a little bit to why resurrection is an imparting of sonship, both for us and, and for Christ as well. All right, so let's, let's dive back into the discussion now. All right, we kind of answered that question. What's the big problem that Romans is presenting the solution to? Death and resurrection is the solution. All right, why does resurrection restore sonship? Well, because sonship of God means that you have the nature that God gives to his children, you have the image of God, and the body is a part of that, um, and, uh, and is, is a very important part of that. All right, so what is Christ's role 
and all that. Well, we kind of alluded to that. Christ's role is that he's the prototype. All right. When you look at these, at these passages pertaining to his humanity, not his deity, but pertaining to his humanity, he went through at his resurrection begetting into this sonship. His body was made into something that by conformity to that body, our body might be made into it one day. And, and this is what you see in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul argues that by resurrection, our body will be conformed to Christ's body. And he says that that will complete restoration into the image of God, into the image of the heavenly. Um, in Acts 13, he tells us that, that the psalm, you are my son, this day I have begotten you, is fulfilled by Christ's resurrection. It was in some sense a begetting. Um, you know, he's, he's called, as we alluded to before in Colossians 1.18, and in Revelation 1.5, in, in a passage from John, he's called the firstborn from the dead. And the word dead is in the plural. He's the firstborn from the dead ones. And then here in Romans 8, we see this whole wonderful passage about how we are going to be coming into sonship by resurrection one day when our bodies are restored. And that happens at the end of the chapter by um, being conformed to the image of Christ. And God specifically ordained that it would happen that way so that Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren. God wanted our restoration to happen by conformity to Christ's body, by union with him, so that he would have a lot of brethren and Christ would be the first one to be born among them. Um, and you can see that, that he's building off this idea that Christ was born by resurrection into this Adamic sonship when his body was made into what our body one day will be made um, by, by union with him. Um, it's fascinating. It's really, really exciting when you look at it. All right, well, what is, uh, okay, so the role of Christ is the prototype. Um, he was the first to be born. Um, what's the role of the Spirit? Because when you look at all of these passages, the Spirit's in, in so many of them, and the Spirit really is the agent of all this happening. He's the one who applies our salvation to us um, uh, in, in that sense. Um, and the Spirit is, is just all the way through. Um, and so this, this is the messianic expectation of the Old Testament that Paul is expounding in Romans 8, um, and that, that he gives the seed form of in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, the passage that we're looking at today. All right, one last question in this. Remember, we're talking about the context. What's the theology that Paul is pulling from the Old Testament? All right, one last question. What is the role of David? Because David appears in our passage, right? Uh, he's from the seed of David. What, is, what does David have to do with anything? Well, you know, in Genesis 3, Adam lost what God had given to him. The image was marred to the point that, that Scripture regards man as having lost sonship of God. We're in need of, of sonship once again. Um, death came. Dominion was lost. The whole thing was messed up. Um, and scripture tells the story of God restoring that. Well, that story starts in Genesis chapter 12 with the Abrahamic covenant. And Abraham and Israel are presented there as an attempt to reclaim what Adam lost. Um, and, uh, and, and so Israel was, was supposed to be a race of reigning sons of God. Israel's called God's firstborn. Um, and, and she was to reclaim everything that Adam lost. And as the epitome of that nation, the Davidic kings were supposed to be uh, the ones who, who reclaimed this. And so it's for that reason that, that the Davidic kings are called the firstborn in, in Psalm 89. And Psalm 2-7, you're my son, this day I've begotten you. That was originally said of the Davidic kings. Um, and all the way through, the Davidic kings were were supposed to do this, and, and did they succeed? No, they failed, because in the Old Testament era, there was no provision for restoration of the image of God. What God gave under Moses, there was no provision for restoring the image of God, and so these men died. Every one of the Davidic kings died. They failed to be the forever reigning son of God, 
um, they failed to reclaim what Adam lost. And it was as they failed one after another that this whole dynasty collectively um, produced a longing for the son of God who would come and who would reign forever and who would not only be the image of God, but he would also be able to restore us into the image of God and to do the restoration work for all of mankind. And so as, as, as the Davidic kings failed one after another, that, that the Old Testament creates and builds this longing for the Messiah to come and to do, to be the last Adam and to do what, uh, what all of these kings failed to do. Um, and, and that's all what Paul's, I think, talking about there in Romans 8 and these other passages where he parallels Christ um, with Adam. And hopefully you were able to read through the discussion of Romans 8 as part of the homework. But you see there in Romans 8, it's all a reclamation of Adam. It's painted as an undoing of Genesis 3. Um, and Christ's role, we've talked a little bit about Christ's role throughout that chapter, is, is the prototype. Um, that what's going to happen to us happened first to him, so that by it happening to us, by union with him, he becomes the first to be born among many brethren. God doesn't just want one Adamic son. He wants a whole race of them. That was his uh, intent from the beginning. And you see there in Romans 8, the Spirit's role. You know, the Holy Spirit occurs hard or is, is seen hardly ever in the book of Romans until you get to Romans 8. And then it's the whole thing's about the Spirit of God and his doing this work. And Romans 8 presents two different stages of life in the spirit. Um, basically what Paul's argument is in Romans 8 is, look, look at what God did, or look at what the spirit of God did for your inner man. He's given you life, and he's given you sonship pertaining to your inner man. And if he could do that for your inner man, then he's also going to do it one day for your outer man. And that's the hope that Paul brings in this chapter. He says, look, look within at what at the life and sonship that you have now. If God's spirit could do that for your inner man, then he will do it one day for your outer man as well, because these are just two stages of life in the spirit. Um, and the spirit's goal is to, is to one day birth us um, by resurrection. So the question is, you know, we, I just talked a lot. Wow, that's a lot of information, right? Um, does Paul have all this in mind in Romans 1, 3 through 4? Is, is he really, is this really what's behind what he's saying? Is this really what he's thinking? Um, and, and I think the answer is yes, because look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. He tells us that this gospel um, is concerning his son, and then look at verse 2, which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, he's explicitly telling us, look, this is nothing new. This is all there in the Old Testament. Everything that the Old Testament uh, expected in the Messiah, that's the gospel. And, and so he grounds his gospel in the Old Testament explicitly, and everything that we talked about there. Um, but then he also talks about Christ's royal messianic lineage from David in verse 3 um, as the foundation for what he's going to say in verse 4. Everybody focuses on verse 4. What does verse 4 mean? Well, it, it's, it's based off of verse 3 and the fact that Christ came from David's line um, and that he is the epitome of that Davidic dynasty. And that Davidic dynasty, again, was attempting to reclaim Adam. And so, yes, he's got all of this in his mind um, as he talks there in Romans 1, uh, 3 through 4. He's establishing the intersection of sonship and resurrection, or of life and resurrection, all the way back to Adam. He's saying all of that is at the heart of what happened to Christ at his resurrection in verse 4. Um, and, uh, and we'll actually dive into the passage in, in a second and kind of work through that. So in summary, Paul's talking about the gospel in Romans chapters 1 through 8. Romans 8 is the capstone of that gospel, the culmination of it. Um, and it's the work of God's spirit to restore our material part, our bodies, by resurrection. 
and thereby to complete restoration into the nature of God's sons. Um, and that's the end goal of our predestination. And God has, has ordained that that happen by conformity to Christ. And God did it that way because he wants Christ to be the first among many brethren, the first to be born. Um, and here in Romans 1, uh, 1 through 4, Paul is introducing that whole uh, discussion, which culminates in Romans 8. Um, in its in its seed form um, and uh, so anyway well maybe we should stop and take a little break here is that is that the idea dr arnold um sure yeah okay. this is a fine time what well actually i don't know what time Perfect. it is yeah this is great so i've got five minutes after i mean we can just come back at like 10 or 11 minutes after um okay yeah this is great and maybe somewhere in here we can or if you want during the break, you can take a look at the chat. Anyway, I don't want to, I want you to get, be able to take a break, but um, yeah. we can, there's some different discussions in the chat too. So good, great. Okay, I'll see every, well, the minute just changed. So let's think like uh, 12 minutes after. So we'll just be back in a bit and uh, pick up where we left off. Great, thank you. God, but it does not yet appear what we will be. Um, and, the, and the fact that there's a future dimension of sonship. And when you look at that passage, he talks about the fact that it's when Christ appears that we will be made like him because we will see him. And the whole thing seems to be talking about a physical uh, resemblance to Christ. And so, uh, you know, when you when you look through um, Hebrews 1 through 2, um, which probably, I don't know, it seems like Luke wrote Hebrews. When you look at even what Gabriel says to Mary um, when he announces Christ's coming, uh, when you look at what John writes in the first three chapters of Revelation, you know, this, this idea, the, these theological themes are all the way through these authors. This isn't just Paul. I'm kind of focusing more on Paul today. Um, but Luke, John, and Paul primarily um, expound this, this idea. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's all the way through these authors. The question, did Christ lose sonship? Um, you know, I think, again, we need to distinguish between Christ's divine nature and divine sonship, which he had from all eternity, and that remains completely unchanged. Um, Christ is 100% God, and, there, and, and as such is 100% immutable. Um, but on the other hand, in the incarnation, he took on something new. He took on complete humanity, and all of our discussion is operating within that, that other side of his humanity. Um, nothing that we're saying in any way abrogates or affects his sonship um, pertaining to his divine nature, which was um, from all eternity um, and was unchanged by the resurrection, or I'm sorry, by the incarnation or by the resurrection. Um, and, uh, but, you know, so what, what was Christ's status before the resurrection? He was incarnated, but not yet resurrected. Um, well, we know he came in sinless humanity, and so um, pertaining to his immaterial part, you know, he was completely sinless, but pertaining to his body, he took on a dying body. How do we know that? Well, because he died. Um, he took on a body that could die so that he could die in our place, um, you know, and, and in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about a change of body. And, and he presents it not only as a change for us, but a change that happened to Christ. Christ took on in the resurrection a, a glorified body to which we will be conformed one day um, that he did not have as a result of the virgin birth. Um, he, he went through that, that glorification of the body process. Um, and so pertaining to uh, his, his status before the resurrection, while in his incarnation, he was completely sinless, but he did have um, a dying, a, 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 uh, or a body that could die, would probably be the most uh, specific way that we could word that. Um, uh, and, and then the resurrection uh, imparted to him uh, the glorified body to which we will be conformed. Um, and so there was a, in that sense, he did take on a new dimension of the nature of God's children pertaining to his humanity. 
at the resurrection. Um, so anyway, so hopefully that that helps with some of those questions, and at the end we can certainly follow up and and uh, and talk more about those. Um, but the important thing is that uh, you know to understand that the distinction between the sonship of Christ from all eternity pertaining to his deity that was in no way abrogated by the incarnation. And then on the other side, you have pertaining to his humanity and his possessing the image of God as a man. That's where our discussion is located. Um, and uh, anyway, so hopefully that, that helps with some of these questions. Um, so let's let's take a look here at the uh, at the passage here then. Let's see. So I'm going to put it up here on the screen, and for the rest of the time, we'll just kind of kind of work through it. You know, when you look at that passage, um, particularly what's there in the box, verses three through four, um, there's a very obvious grammatical parallel between verses three and verses four. And I've used color coding there just to, to reveal that. Um, but even if you're not uh, familiar with Greek, you can see the word up here for sun ends in a kind of an omicron upsilon or an ou and down here you've got this right here and you got the same thing happening right there so both of these who was appointed down here and who came um, are both modifying son they're both telling us something about the son he was the son who came and the son who was appointed he's telling us two things about about the son and then you've got the purple which starts with um, the ek preposition, you got the purple down here, which starts with x, which is just another form of the same preposition. All right, you've got kata starting the green line, and you got kata starting the green line, according to the flesh, according to the spirit. Obviously, there's a parallel between these two, um, between these two uh, statements in verses three and four. But consensus about what the uh, how the how the two relate is is where people. Um, uh, have some debate. Um, but the question of how the two relate to each other, right, um, I'll kind of refer to the yellow and the and the orange. You've got the yellow here on the top up here, um, and then you've got the orange down here at the bottom. All right, the question of how the yellow and the orange relate um, is, is at the heart of understanding what's going on here um, uh, between, between the two. So in, in days gone by, a lot of people uh, would say that verse 3, the yellow, was referring to Christ's humanity, and verse 4 was referring to his deity, um, the two natures of Christ. And that's, that's kind of an antiquated position. Nobody really, or, well, most people wouldn't, wouldn't really hold to that anymore. Today, what most scholars would say is that the two sides of the contrast are the two stages of Christ's incarnational existence. So verse three in the yellow was his pre-resurrection incarnate state. And verse four was his post-resurrection incarnate state. Um, and as, as we talked about above, the phrase according to the flesh there is often taken as speaking of the weakness of the um, of the incarnation and as the counterpoint to in power, right? Which already you can see a bit of a problem because according to the flesh is in green and in power is in blue. So they aren't, the, those aren't the two things that Paul's contrasting, but that's that's the idea that people will put forth. Um, we'll say that Christ um, is saying that, or, or that Paul is saying that Christ received power and unveiled his sonship by resurrection. He was weak. He was apparently only a man from David in verse three, um, and that's the whole idea of, of according to the flesh. So in, in talking about the passage, what we're gonna do is start out with this phrase, according to the flesh, all right, this one right here. Um, and uh, Dr. Arnold, when I move the, um, the pen around the screen, does that actually, can everybody see that or can they only see when I write? No, I can see the, the pen moving around the as well. pen moving around and dancing around. Okay, great, all right. So I can use that to point to things. Um, so let's start with the little phrase, according to the flesh. We'll kind of begin there because that's where people focus. You know, according to the flesh, he was weak. He was only a man. That's his incarnation. Um, and then verse four somehow um, gave him something that solved that problem of weakness. All right, and they, they have this contrast. So let's, let's start with talking about according to the flesh. 
when when you see the word flesh, you're tempted to think of that as being the unredeemable part of man that Paul talks about, particularly because he uses the word that way in Romans 7 and 8. Um, but Paul uses this word flesh um, in different ways. Um, and uh, let's see here. So like, for example, in, in Romans 2.28, Paul uses the word flesh to speak of the human body, right? And I think that the way that Paul uses flesh, even in Romans 7 through 8, is very closely connected to the human body um, all the way through. But in Romans 2.28, he, he clearly speaks about it as connected um, or as being the human body. And then every single time in Romans that you see this phrase kata, flesh, the exact phrase in green there, every time you see that in Romans, um, uh, it's speaking, it's in Romans 4, 1, 9, 3, and 9, 5, every single one of those times, it's talking about the concept of human ancestry. Uh, it's not talking about your body per se, or the unredeemable part of man, these other senses of the word flesh, it's talking about human ancestry. And so what Paul's talking about here, when he says according to the flesh, he isn't focusing on some pre-resurrection weakness that Christ had. He's talking about human ancestry, right? So, um, uh, you know, what, what he's saying here is uh, pertaining to his human ancestry, he was from the seed of David. He was from the line of David. Um, and uh, and he's, he's not trying to make some statement about, about weakness. Um, you notice as well that kata flesh, according to the flesh, is parallel not to in power, but to according to the Holy Spirit. The contrast that he's drawing here is between human ancestry, according to the flesh, and the green on the lower half of the contrast is according to the Spirit not in power. So he's not contrasting according to the flesh weakness with power. He's contrasting according to the flesh with according to the spirit. All right. Um, and, and as we've noted, Paul's theology of resurrection includes the prominent place of the spirit as the agent of the one who gives life. In fact, it's not here on my shelf right now, um, but in the, is it the New Evangelical, uh, or no, sorry, uh, New, New Studies in Biblical Theology, the, the work on the Holy Spirit is entitled, He Who Gives Life, because this is the work of the Spirit to give life. All the way through the Scripture, it's the Spirit who gives life. Um, and so on the one hand, he's saying um, uh, that, uh, that, a, that according or pertaining to Christ's human ancestry, he was from the seed of David, but pertaining to the work of the Spirit, he was appointed Son of God with power. And this is, this is the two sides of, of what he's saying. Um, the age of resurrection is the age of the Spirit. And this is what the Old Testament expected the Messiah to bring, was the age of the Spirit. Um, and so, on the one hand, his being from the royal line of David was owing to his human ancestry. And on the other side, um, his resurrection was owing to the work of God's Spirit. And he's, he's putting the two out there as being the responsible agents for, um, for being, or, or for the purple. The purple, the seed of David, was because he was from, uh, or according, or was, was pertaining to his human ancestry. His human ancestry was responsible for it. On the bottom part, um, the spirit in the green was the reason for the purple. The spirit was the reason for his resurrection and the agent of his resurrection. Right. So according to the flesh is just talking about his human ancestry um, and, and putting that out there. All right, let's talk for a second about uh, the phrase here concerning his son um, up here at the top. All right, because the whole discussion revolves around the question of Christ's sonship. Right, And Paul is, is talking here about, about the sonship of Christ. Um, you know, a lot of times people focus on verse 4 when they want to interpret this, uh, this passage. Um, but, but verse 4 is not the only reference to Christ's sonship, appointed son of God with power. Um, verse 3 sets out his son as the major topic 
that's under discussion in these verses and verses three through four are a unit. And so these two participles, the one who came or the one who was born and the one who was appointed, the two parts in blue, both of those participles are attributive to his son. So let me kind of demonstrate what we're saying here. All right, up here, we, we said that we have his son and down here we have who came and then we have who was appointed, all right? And this is modifying son and this is modifying son. So essentially Paul is saying, let me tell you about the son of God. All right, now I'm gonna tell you two things about the son of God. The first thing is that pertaining to his human ancestry, he came from the seed of David. That pertains to his sonship. And the second thing is he was appointed to be the son of God in power by the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection from the dead. That also pertains to his human sonship. In other words, the yellow and the orange are two things that are being told us about the sonship of Christ um, in this passage. And so a lot of people approach this passage and try to understand it as a contrast between the yellow and the orange, between verses three and four. And my argument is that if you if you approach this passage and try to understand it as a contrast, you go wrong, all right? Emphasis upon contrast between verses three through four is actually not a correct approach um, to the passage. Um, it is true that what happened in verse three was true before his resurrection and verse four speaks about things that weren't true until after his resurrection. You know, there is a succession here between verses three and four, but interpreting the two passages or the two verses as a contrast is actually misguided. Verse three is not presenting some kind of pre-resurrection deficiency in Christ that the resurrection came along and solved. That's not the function of verse three. Um, and if you approach the passage that way, then you start asking yourself, well, what's not in verse three that is in verse four? And that's what the resurrection gave him. That's not what's going on there. Um, instead, um, you know, what's, what's going on here is against the backdrop of Romans eight and the Old Testament messianic expectation that we talked about, the relationship between these two statements verse three and verse four, isn't a contrast, it's a succession. Um, Israel's kings, specifically the Davidic dynasty, failed at reclaiming Adam. And it was out of that failure that the expectation of the Messiah came. Um, in other words, what's going on here is, in, is verse three is actually his qualification or his credentials for verse four happening. It was expected that the one to whom verse four would happen, the one who would reclaim Adam, that he would come from David's line. And so you can see how verses three and four are not a contrast. Um, instead, it's a, a succession. Verse three is, is telling us what was true of Christ um, that qualified him to be the one to have verse four happen to him. Um, and to have this happen by, by resurrection. Um, he was from the line of David, and um, all the way through Paul's writings, um, it's, uh, it's to one who was from the line of David that this work of resurrection would happen, and he would become, um, uh, he would become the Son of God to whom we could be conformed. Um, so verse three is, isn't telling us something that was wrong with Christ that the resurrection fixed. Rather, verse three is telling us why he qualified for what happened in, in verse four. And so according to his human ancestry, pertaining to his humanity, this is why we're saying this whole discussion happens within the human nature or dis discussion of the human nature of Christ, um, pertaining to his humanity, his sonship of God was something um, for which he was qualified because he was from David's line. Um, and so the sonship of God, the black up at the top, first thing we need to know about that sonship is that it came because he was from David's line. Second thing we need to know about it in verse four is that it came by resurrection. 
these are the two things that Paul's laying out here for us. Um, and so we saw that the descent from David wasn't enough. Um, the, old, the Old Testament kings failed um, because there wasn't any provision under the Mosaic law for the image of God to be restored. Um, that was a New Testament, a new covenant provision. Um, and, uh, and so because of that, uh, the Old Testament kings failed and Christ coming from that line was uh, the, the Davidic king who, who did succeed. Um, let's see here. Skip down through my notes here to save a little bit of time. Um, okay. You know, it's interesting. I'll just throw this out as well. But um, who was responsible for verse three happening? Who was responsible for Christ being born of Mary from the line of David? It was the Spirit of God. Gabriel told us that the Spirit of God would come upon Mary. Um, and so verse 3 is actually the work of the Spirit of God. Verse 4, um, the resurrection, is, is the work of the Spirit of God as well. And so that's, that's just kind of a side note that, that God's Spirit is involved all the way through. Um, in that way. Uh, let's see here. Okay. All right. So I, we'll, we'll kind of pick back up here. This is this is Paul's conception of, of Christ. Um, remember, he's telling us about the gospel of God, and it pertains to the Son of God, and he wants us to know two things about that Son of God, two things about his sonship. Um, and, uh, and then he gets to Romans 8, and in Romans 8, um, the gospel culminates in the Spirit of God by resurrection, conforming our body to Christ's resurrection body, and thereby completing our restoration into the nature of sons of God. And Paul wants us to know here in Romans 1, 3 through 4, that what is going to happen to us in Romans 8 happened to Christ. Um, and he's sort of just throwing it out as like an initial uh, teaser statement. Um, that Christ is the uh, is the prototype. So Paul is here setting the stage for his that that discussion of the uh, of the gospel. Um, let's talk for a second then about what everybody wonders about um, this word right here, uh, appointed, or a lot of the translations will say declared. All right, um, and uh, and talk about that you know, against the backdrop of the Old Testament messianic expectation within the theology, the framework that we spent the first hour establishing, within all of that, what this passage appears to be talking about is an actual impartation of sonship by resurrection, right? But when we look at the actual terminology and grammar of the passage, is that conclusion substantiated? can you know what what happens with this word appointed um well you know i i talked a little bit above about how this word um used to be argued to mean declared um and that's that's largely an obsolete um position at this point most people would would accept the fact that the word actually means appointed rather than declared the reason for that is that when you look at the other usage of the word in the new testament um it, it is always talking about appointment, not mere declaration. Um, so this word is used, um, every other time it's used of Christ, it, it talks about appointment. In, in Luke 22, 22, he was appointed to betrayal and capture. Um, in Acts 2, 23, he was appointed to capture and crucifixion. In Acts 10, 42, he was, uh, he's appointed to be the judge of the living and the dead. Um, in Acts 17, 31, he's appointed to be the judge of the world. This, these aren't mere declarations. These are actual appointments to something. Um, and, and that is what the word means. The last three occurrences of the word in the New Testament are not of Christ. They're of other things, but they're of appointments to, of those other things. Um, in Acts 11, 29, there's an appointment or determination to send a contribution to the brethren in Judea. Um, in Acts 17, 26, 
there's an appointment of mankind's times and boundaries and habitations. And in Hebrews 4, 7, God has appointed a day of repentance. And so this word, you look at it and, and every single other time that it's used in the New Testament, it's not talking about a declaration of something that's already true. It's talking about an appointment of something to be true. Um, and, uh, and, and so lexically, this word means to appoint something, not to declare something. Um, and for that reason, most people are, are no longer arguing that the word means declared. They're arguing that it means appointed. Um, and so the debate um, has moved, rather than, rather than talking about this word appointed or declared, the debate has moved um, to focus instead on the little phrase in power. And let me see if I can kind of circle that so that we all know what we're, what we're looking at here. This is kind of where everybody parks their discussion right now, um, the little phrase in power. Um, you know, you can see just visually there in the layout of the passage that in power doesn't have any corresponding line in verse three in the yellow, all right? Everything else fits really neatly. Um, you've got participle up here and you got participle down here you got purple here you got purple down there the two x phrases you've got the green kata phrase you got the green kata phrase everything's really neat and parallel except for in power it just stands out it doesn't it doesn't have any corresponding line in the first half of the uh of the contrast there um and so it it seems like and and i've tried to reflect this by putting it in blue it seems like that it belongs as part of that phrase, who was appointed the son of God in power. That whole thing is blue, All right? Um, it, it fits as part of that, as part of that phrase. Um, but the watershed question is what does in power modify, All right? What was actually powerful? Um, the side of the debate that denies the resurrection in any way imparted sonship to Christ holds that it modifies son adverbially. So it's modifying the word son here. In other words, before the resurrection, he was the son of God without power. And after the resurrection, he was the son of God with power. And this is what the function of, of in power uh, takes in the passage. It's, it's telling us that the son of God was, was given power. That's what changed at the resurrection. Um, on the other side of the debate, people would say that the word in power modifies appointed. So he was a powerfully appointed to be the son of God. And you can see how they're, they're saying that because they want son of God to be what was appointed, not power to be what was appointed. Um, and, and so that would be the, uh, the other side of the debate. Well, when you look at the word uh, power throughout the New Testament, um, it occurs uh, a lot of times, a lot of times it's the object of N like it is here. And when it's in those positions, sometimes it's adverbial and sometimes it's adjectival. So just tracing out the usage of in power uh, doesn't help us because it can be both. <laughs> it's used either way. Um, uh, and, and it really, you know, just just from the usage of the phrase, it, it could be adverbial or it could be um, adjectival. Um, uh, but in this, so, so anyway, in this passage, um, the deciding factor um, isn't whether it's adverbial or adjectival. The deciding factor is really what is affected by the verb appointed. Was he appointed to be son or was the son appointed to have power? What was appointed? Was it sonship that was appointed? Or was it um, power that was appointed? And when you look through the passage, there's, there's arguments for both sides. Um, you know, on the one hand, several considerations would support the idea. And uh, maybe I can just kind of try to reflect it. The question that we're asking is, was it sonship that was appointed or was it power that was appointed, All right? Well, there's, there's several arguments to support the idea that it was sonship that was appointed, the top arrow. Um, you know, on the one hand, 
uh, or in the in the first place, there's all the con the contextual considerations and the theology and the background that we talked about already. Um, and Paul overtly sets that Old Testament messianic expectation as the foundation for what he's saying here um, by telling us that it was proclaimed beforehand through the prophets and by saying that he was from the seed of David as the qualification for this happening. Right? So contextually, um, it would seem that, um, that Paul's talking about an appointment to sonship, a reclamation of what Adam lost. And, uh, and we talked about all that. Um, you know, think as well uh, that Paul um, has already stated up above here that the topic of the discussion is the Son of God. All right. Um, so if he's merely saying that the resurrection gave the Son of God power, then heristhentos is, is a confusing choice of verb. Um, to say that the Son of God was appointed to be Son of God in power um, is redundant, and it would make a lot more sense for him to use a verb like, like give power or, uh, or bestow power. The word appoint doesn't talk about giving an object like power. The word appoint talks about putting a person in a position, all right? Um, and so he, the, the very use of the word uh, appoint um, seems to indicate that, that it's actually son that's receiving the force of the verb, not, not just power. Um, uh, let's see, you know, we, we talk about the fact that, that he's already said that he's the son of God up here. And so if he was merely saying that God was giving him power, he could have much more simply stated that. He could have said, um, the son whom God gave power. But instead, he says, the son whom God appointed to be the son in power. And the fact that the son occurs a second time indicates that it's, it is significant to what's going on here. Um, and when you, when you just look at this, um, it, it's pretty evident that, that he's not just saying that God gave power um, all around the, the way that the passage is, is structured. Um, it seems like he's talking about a about actually giving um, sonship. Um, you know, there's a, a third consideration here that huiyu, or son, not duname uh, power, is the object complement of the predicate of herizo. Um, just when you look at it grammatically, you can see that there in the passage that it was son that was appointed, not power that was appointed. Um, power is the object of a, of a preposition. Um, and so when you look uh, when you look through here, there, there's just a lot of arguments that that it's actually sun that was appointed, not not just power. But on the other hand, there's several considerations that would support an appointment to power. That power is what was appointed. Um, uh, you know, if if power was not a part of what the resurrection appointed, then um, then you have to embrace the adverbial use of the phrase with power. But in the in this you know, in the chiastic structure of the passage, um, power doesn't have any corresponding line in the first half of, of the passage in, in verse three. And so it, it kind of, it interrupts the neat chiasm and it stands out as something that's really important, all right? Um, obviously power is a big part of what Paul's communicating here. And, and if, you, if you wanna say that it's taking an adverbial function. He was powerfully appointed to be the son of God. In that interpretation, power doesn't warrant a really important place in the passage because what else was the resurrection than a powerful act? You know, it's it, you know, the, the resurrection was powerful and, and there's no big deal made or, or there's no important theological truth communicated by saying that the resurrection was a powerful act. But the way that Paul structures the passage, power actually is really important here. It, he breaks up the chiasm to emphasize it. Um, and, and so power is actually, in some sense, probably what was appointed. Um, and, and so when you look at the passage, it seems like sonship was appointed and power was appointed. Um, and it really could be both. And when you trace the use of power throughout the New Testament, 
I think you understand that it's both that were appointed. He was appointed to be son and he was appointed to have power um, by the resurrection. And you find there theology in that word power that's worthy of that really important place in Paul's chiasm. Um, you know, every New Testament occurrence, except for somewhat cryptic one in Philippians 3.10, um, every New Testament reference to impartation of power, dunamis, by resurrection, talks about one of two kinds of power. Um, in the first place, there's the power of messianic rule. And you find this in Matthew 26 at the trial when Christ talks about having power to rule um, because of his um, of his resurrection. He's alluding back to Psalm 110 and Daniel 7. Right? So you have the power of, of messianic rule. But resurrection also in 1 Corinthians 15 imparts um, the power of life. Paul says there that the body is sown in weakness and raised in power. In Hebrews 7.16, he talks about Christ being raised with the power of an indestructible life. Um, and so this dichotomy between Romans 1.4 talking about imparting sonship and imparting power, it's actually a false dichotomy. The resurrection imparted sonship and sons of God have a certain kind of power. They have the power to live forever and the power to reign as Adam was intended to reign, the dominion that the image originally um, created us, uh, uh, or the dominion that, that the image of God enabled us to exercise. Um, and so when you look through this passage, um, it becomes evident that what's going on here is Paul is, um, is talking about the gospel that he's going to lay out in Romans 1 through 8. Right. And in Romans 8, he's going to tell us that the culmination of our salvation is God giving us life and sonship as his children. And that's going to come by resurrection, conforming our body to that of Christ, because he went through that birth process by resurrection. Um, and, uh, and, and then he, he fleshes that out in, in Colossians and, um, and uh, Luke records some of his teaching in, in Hebrews 1 through 2, and, and then he fleshes that out in 1 Corinthians 15 further as well. Um, but here in Romans 1, 3 through 4, he's just giving us kind of a, in seed form the idea that what's going to happen to us in Romans 8 already happened to Christ, um, and that he was given the power of life and the power to reign as, as a messianic um, uh, as the messianic reclaimer of Adam. Um, and all that happened by the Spirit of God. And then you don't see the Spirit of God again, hardly at all, between here and Romans 8. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes back in Romans 8 to say, you know what happened to Christ in Romans 1, 4? Guess what? The Spirit's going to do it for us too in Romans 8 as the capstone of our salvation. Um, and uh, and it, it seems like that's that's what Paul's doing here, that that he's, he's sort of saying, you know, what's what, what he knows he's going to write about in Romans 8, he's telling us, guess what? It already happened to Christ. Um, and he's, he's sort of uh, putting out a teaser there for uh, that discussion in Romans 8 of the capstone um, of our salvation. Um, and I, I like to just um, close with this, with a song, whenever I'm thinking about, about these things, um, there's, there's this little uh, this little chorus to a song, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering son. And in that little phrase, you have encapsulated everything that we've talked about. And then it says that endless is the victory thou or death hast won. In every single one of these passages that you look at in Paul or John or Luke, um, it never stops with Christ. It never stops with the fact that Christ got something by resurrection. It's always for a purpose that we might have it too. Um, and Christ did it all that, that he might conquer death and that we might have um, endless victory over death as well. By union with him coming to share in the life and sonship um, that he claimed and that the Father gave, actually, well, the Father and the Spirit gave him um, by 
by resurrection. So anyway, that's that's my understanding of this passage. Um, and I, I think when you when you look at the context of Romans and of of what Paul says um, in these passages where he discusses sonship and resurrection, that there's a, a theology that Paul has. And you know, my, my dissertation, and actually when I spoke last time, Dr. Arnold brought this up, my dissertation is titled A Biblical Theology, and he was looking at it and saying, well, this is actually very systematic. But I, I think, you know, if we go back to, to this slide here, you sort of have, you know, down here would be biblical theology, um, and up here probably would be more systematic theology. And I think in the middle, we need to establish a third discipline of small a author systematic theology. Um, and that, that's really what we're doing is trying to figure out what was Paul's small a author systematic theology. Um, and, uh, and, and then once you sort of discover his idea of the relationship between sonship and resurrection, both for us and for Christ, all of a sudden these passages in Colossians 1 and Romans 8 and, um, and, and the passages and other authors that were influenced by Paul, um, all of a sudden you start seeing that, that he's, he's drawing on that theology without ever stopping and just explicitly laying it out um, as clearly as what he does in, in Romans 8. So, anyway. Great. You know what? I think um, I think you earn a special badge or a title. I, I don't think any of our other teachers in the whatever, like three years that we've been doing this, has ever ended with a poem. So anyway, yeah, you get the badge for ending with a poem, which, as we all know, is ideal, uh, ideal practice. So anyway, way to go. I got to I got to I got to try to catch up with you on that one. It's good. Um, all right. Here's something I would I was wondering, and I, I think I got your concept better. It's just natural. This time around, I got it. It just kind of like dug out another <laughs> layer. <laughs> and it got into my head better. Your distinction between um, and it's very helpful. Sonship, you know, sonship's eternal in respect to his to Jesus' deity, and then it's acquired. No, anyway, it's completed. It's it's fulfilled in respect to his humanity at the resurrection, uh, or it's he sets the way for us as humans, the new Adam, uh, so that humans then know sonship. And I'm getting that right. That distinction between deity and humanity, and how those link. Um, I can see that that working on a systematic basis. I was wondering, what about a a an exegetical basis for that, or is it just is it a systematic theological necessity that we you know we extrapolate, or can we also find data that supports that particular distinction? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think when you um, two two things that I would say is that you do have. Um, uh, you do have explicit statements like I would look at Romans 1, 3, according to the flesh as specifically locating what we're talking about within his humanity. Um, and then the other thing that I would point to is that in all of these passages, it's per he's, he's portrayed as being um, uh, everything that we're talking about is portrayed as being a reclaiming of Adam because he's from the line of David. And that all is, is, is definitely his humanity. Um, so yeah, systematic theology dictates that we hold, that we distinguish the two, lest we be heretics. Um, but I think when you look at these passages, what Paul's talking about there is, is his humanity. You know, I would, I would go to like Colossians one as well. He says there that he's the image of the invisible God. And so I make the point there in the dissertation, how could something image an invisible God? And the word invisible clearly, I think, means that when he talks about image, he's talking about in the incarnation. It was in the incarnation that the invisible God um, became to us visible. And because he's the image of the invisible God, he's the firstborn of all creation. He takes the place that Adam was intended to take. And then he goes on and explains what that means in the rest of the passage, that he was the firstborn from the dead. That's how he got that firstborn status. Um, you know, there's, there's a, so, so yeah, when you look at these passages, um, Paul, Paul does these things that, that locate it within the incarnation. 
it's good. I mean, what what really um, what I what I enjoy about your thesis is that there are a bunch of data points that I don't know. I mean, we come to them and we kind of do the best we can with them, but we end up sort of like, okay, this is here and here's what it does mean, here's what it doesn't mean, but not really linking it in a way that, that what do you say? Not in a way that um, points forward, you know, okay, I see the links. Uh, we just sort of hold them in abeyance or something. And your thesis yeah. starts making links that make sense, um, that kind of drive forward somewhere, like the pieces come together and, and the harmony across them is, uh, anyway, it's very compelling. The, the, the thing that's tough about, the, about your thesis is what would be a strength about it. It's just, oh, okay, this is, this is interesting. I'm not reading this elsewhere, um, which is the, I think the point you're wanting to push forward the conversation. So, I mean, because you're carving out new ground and you're pushing forward the conversation in that same way and to the same extent, it's sort of like, okay, new ground. Wow, not sure. Um, <laughs> so it's good. It's the strength of it, <laughs> that it is making new connections. And yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, and I don't know that, I mean, like you look at John MacArthur, how he espoused the idea of incarnational sonship what would drive a man like John MacArthur to say the things that he said? Well, he's seeing something in the scripture. Now, he fit it into his theology in the wrong place, and later he had to retract it. But, but he's seeing something there, you know, and other people like, um, you know, like David Garner's work, Sons in the Sun, came out in 2016. Um, you know, he's proposing this idea of two sonships of Christ. Um, he just uh, would view the human sonship as being primarily a functional thing rather than something that's actually ontological, ontologically true. So it, it is a conversation. I'm not exactly a Lone Ranger. And that, that does give me some comfort. So how did people respond to that study? Um, well, my committee really liked it. So Dr. Talbert's trying to work on an option for publishing. You know, he really, really liked it. Um, you know, I, I think it specific, specifically um, uh, what the committee liked about it was its ability to explain certain passages um, like this one or, or even what's going on in Romans 8 um, with conformity to the image of Christ and the firstborn and all the firstborn passages. You know, I mean, nobody interprets a passage in the abstract. You interpret every passage through your systematic theology, essentially. And, you know, it, it'd be very difficult to walk into most churches and preach Romans 1, 3 through 4, because most people have a certain systematic theology that they're going to process what's happening here through. And that's why we spent the first hour trying to sort of correct that systematic theology a little bit. Um, you know, and, and once you get it sort of corrected, then you can come to individual passages and like, oh, that's why, you know, and that it's that that was the value that they appreciated in this so. yeah that was another thought i had as you were presenting it some of the distinctions and details are so nuanced and some of the some of the interpretational work is so complex one thought that hit me wow i mean it would to try to communicate this let's say to a lay audience would be really hard is it's very detailed very nuanced but the next thought i had was i i think some of the reason that we can present more like older and more established views and we can get that work done in a lay audience context is because you know layer upon layer teaching it in a lot of different contexts people are already familiar with that reading of it so you're actually what you're doing is you're kind of going down a rut that's already there and therefore it's a little bit easier to grab um but yeah if we were i mean if this is the way to go then over time you can get that. I mean, you kind of have to go through it multiple times and, and I mean, just the way I felt. The second time through, I caught more. Um, so multiple times it will start to feel familiar and it's something that can be communicated. Just, I think, takes time and repeated teaching. Yeah, um, yeah a lot that's of, good. Um, go ahead. I, I, um, you know, a, a lot of what's the conception of Christ's sonship that's in people's mind is something that's built up for a long time in the church, 
And so there's a temptation to say, oh, this is, this is not good because it's not what we've held. But I think what I'm doing here with these two senses of Christ's sonship is just fleshing out another aspect of Chalcedon, not going against Chalcedon. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and so what we, would, what we would call orthodoxy um, is, is maybe more of a snowball of thousand or 2,000 years of studying the scripture. Um, and, and then it's within that snowball of, of that system of one sense of Christ's sonship that we try to understand every passage. And it just, some of them, that's just not what's going on there, you know. Um, and D.A. Carson wrote a book on the Son of God where he really cautions us against, um, uh, against just holding one sense of Christ's sonship. You know, so other people are, are recognizing this and um, there's no one quite fleshed it out. Do you know Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? No, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I, it's a completely different discussion, but it's in, um, yeah, anyway, it's just like a scientific context. But the context there goes, we have certain models, explanatory models, and the data accumulates and uh, maybe sometimes against the models. And it accumulates, but we continue to try to like, basically we could kind of fit the data in, kind of force it in in different places. We keep on forcing the data in until eventually the data accumulates large enough that we can't hold our models anymore and the model collapse and we collapses and we rebuild a new model. Um, so anyway, the question always goes, you know, is the data enough yet that we need to collapse a certain model? And I'm not saying that you're collapsing a model, um, but a certain, framework for understanding it. I mean, we, this is the way that thought happens. We kind of, we, we need to keep on testing things and okay, but maybe, maybe this is a better way or consider this. And then, yeah. So, I mean, I'm very, very glad for, and I, it, some of the, uh, the explanatory usefulness of the framework you're proposing, it makes sense in a lot of these texts. Anyway, I'm looking forward to continuing to learn with it. Thank you. Thank you again for the the excellent work in presenting it. Um, so you've heard from our guest, <laughs> and uh, as you have further questions or further discussion, we can take, we can stay in touch. And um, anyway, we're, of course, again, very grateful for his time and the effort he put into this, representing years of study that, that preceded the presentation tonight. Um, and then we'll look forward next time to hearing from Dr. Olinger and continuing on from there. You have a homework assignment but it's a very short one, and I did that on purpose. We've had some heavier uh, homework assignments. I would just add in here, if you did not get to the reading here with Dr. Manick, I think that's it's fine if you didn't get it before the lecture. I would encourage you, since our next homework assignment is lighter, see if you can go back now. If you missed this one, read it now. And I think that's just fine too, hearing a presentation first and then going back and reading it can also get it in your mind at another angle. Um, so anyway, I hope you'll take advantage of the, the lighter homework next time to kind of go back and hit this one. And uh, Dr. Minnick, thank you again. We'll look forward to, uh, we'll look forward to hopefully hearing from you in another context, <laughs> but we're grateful for the time that you gave us tonight. Okay, goodbye all, see you next time. <laughs>